Uh, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Hannah Valentine as our guest speaker for our Cultural Competency Grand Rounds. Uh, I know Sherry was extremely excited about uh, Dr. Valentine being able to speak with us. And unfortunately, she's not able to be here. She had a family emergency. So uh, Jim and I will co-moderate uh, the session here. Uh, Dr. Valentine is the first NIH Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity and a Senior Investigator in the Intramural Research Program at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Prior to starting this position at the NIH in 2014, she was Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine and the Senior Associate Dean for Diversity and Leadership here at Stanford. She held that uh, position or was here at Stanford for 10 years. She is nationally recognized for her transformative approaches to diversity and is the recipient of the NIH Director's Pathfinder Award for Diversity in the Scientific Workforce. She is currently leading NIH efforts to promote diversity through innovation across the NIH funded biomedical workforce using a range of evidence-based approaches. In addition, Dr. Valentine maintains an active clinical research program that continues to have high impact on patient care. Current research extends her previous um, finding that an organ transplant is essentially a genome transplant and that monitoring the level of donor DNA in the recipient's blood as a marker of organ damage will detect early stages of rejection. She is currently overseeing a multi-site consortium of mid-Atlantic transplant centers to validate these findings clinically toward the development of a non-invasive tool for detecting early signs of organ rejection. True uh, clinician scientist here uh, and leader. Uh, so we are extremely excited and her title of her talk is Bias and Systemic Racism in Academic Healthcare, NIH Strategies for Change. Dr. Valentine, welcome. Good morning. I may, may I say I am delighted to be here, Dr. Pierce. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, always coming back and interacting with my colleagues at Stanford, where I grew my career of 32 years, is always very exciting and especially my interaction with the surgical department because when I came to Stanford in 1985 I had tremendous support from the cardiothoracic surgery department, uh, Dr. Norm Norman Shumway in particular. So I have a particular soft spot for uh, departments of surgery all over the place and I love the way they are actually innovating and, and being leading the, 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 the space of diversity. So Thank you very much for this introduction. Um, what I'd like to do in the next 40 minutes or two is to talk about why diversity and inclusion matter, to um, show you some data, because I think it's through the lens of the data that the work can become more compelling and come to life. Um, I will talk to you a lot of the time about bias as it pertains to a range of issues in academic medicine through implicit, explicit, and frank racism. And then I will sum up by uh, talking about the NIH's approaches to inclusive excellence, which we define as creating those environments in which everybody can thrive and be a successful scientist, researcher, and clinician. So this, uh, in this talk, um, this is really focused a lot on an implicit bias. And what I hope to do is to um, get to you to increase your awareness of implicit bias, uh, an unconscious bias, what it is, what, uh, what it isn't, and most importantly, how to overcome or mitigate the effects uh, of, of bias. So let us start off by painting the picture of why diversity and inclusion and equity matter. 
we know now from so many research studies that when we have a diverse scientific workforce, we are more creative, innovative in our approach to solutions of complex problems of human health and disease. And what can be more complex than that of health disparities? So having this diversity re, uh, results in us broadening the scope of inquiry, and we're more likely to be able to uh, address differences in uh, different diseases as they uh, pertain to different groups. And right here in my own field in cardio cardiology, we have seen very clearly since more women have entered the field, we are now uh, spawned a whole new area of heart disease in women because we ask more questions and got more answers and that would translate not only to better care for women, but better understanding of cardiovascular disease in general. And that is why in my own field currently in cardiac transplant rejection uh, within NIH, I am studying what it is that, why it is that African-American uh, recipients of organ transplant are more likely to reject their organs um, than others. And it's not to do with because they don't take their medication. It's to do with some of the uh, genetic differences in the genomics. We're using genomic tools to understand that. The third reason why this is important is the sheer changing demographics. People like myself a few years ago speaking on this matter would say, well, by 2050, the minority will be the majority. What well, it's actually already happened in California, in certain age groups. And so if we really are to meet the goal of recruiting and retaining the most um, talented into biomedical sciences, then we must be sure to be pulling from our entire intellectual capital. And all of this has significant implications with the global preeminence of research uh, in this nation. I'd like to start off by showing you some demographics and that are particularly related to your field in general surgery. And this data is the most recent data from the AMC. And as you can see, women comprise about 24 to 25% of general surgeons. It's, at least that's what the WMC data tells us. And when we look at racial and ethnic underrepresented groups, that is to say, uh, Black, Hispanic, Native American Pacific Islander, what you see is that representation is about 14%. And although obviously it does not reflect the percentage in the general population, I would say in general terms, uh, that is uh, more uh, the better representation in general surgery than in many other arenas. I'd like to actually think about representation at the leadership levels, because I firmly believe that once we have a more diverse leadership, as uh, having grown the pipeline, we are more likely to achieve our goals of diversity and inclusion. And I've been tracking this really nicely, and what we're showing here is the percentage of department chairs across the US News and World top 10 institutions. And what you can see, I'm very pleased to see that Stanford takes the lead, whereas most of the institute, institutions are around the 20% mark for women chairs. Stanford is pretty close to 40%. Only the University of Wisconsin, as a matter of fact, is at 50%. So this is really important. And the national average you can see drawn around here is about 20%. So that's good, but should we rest on our laurels? No, we've have got a long way to go. And certainly, especially for underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, the representation in leadership is uh, really still quite poor. So what is the net impact of implicit bias and racism on the work that we all do? Actually, what happens is that it perpetuates this lack of inclusion. And that occurs through a number of ways, and these five are just examples. As a person from an underrepresented group, this feeling of constantly being isolated, 
lack of sense of belonging. I tell the story of when I first moved from the Gambia into London with my parents at the age of 13 and finding myself as the only student of color in a high school of 500, that was really quite daunting. And that feeling of having come as being part of a majority group to now being regarded as a minority group was really, uh, it had an intense effect on everything, uh, including my academic trajectory, which really suffered. And by the end of high school, I was had no intentions of going to university. Luckily, uh, I got a job in a laboratory of biochemistry. And then after a year, uh, everything turned around and I got on my trajectory. But this effect of lack of sense of belonging is quite uh, remarkable. A second issue is the minority tax. This is when we are all, we meaning women, people from underrepresented racial ethnic groups are expected to serve as mentors. All of our students who are from underrepresented group looks to us and we serve a lot on committees, et cetera. But guess what? That service is often unrecognized uh, in things that really count in a university like appointments and promotions. And so we spend all that time there. And then by the time it comes to tenure decisions, guess what? The comment is we haven't made progress on our uh, research. So very important to guard against that. Uh, sexual and racial harassment, very important. And for the individual, this worry of fulfilling a stereotypic expectation so that you sort of internalize and that can actually result in um, the performance actually going down. It's called stereotype threat. And then finally, very often, individuals, women, people from underrepresented groups are held at different standards. There's this hyper vigilance of the errors people watching them uh, scrutinize for failures. So very important, uh, all of this. So uh, if you want just one article to read, I will point you to this one that was published last year by Rachel Roper. And it really beautifully summarizes all of the uh, factors and the, gives uh, wonderful examples of what is happening in, uh, in um, bias in so many fields, the scientific workforce, hiring and promotion, peer review, grading of students, grading by students and trainees of their um, mentors. This is a critical one that often gets forgotten. And I've seen a numbers of careers destroyed because they are wrongly downgraded by students and trainees. And, and then suddenly their tra trajectory is derailed. And now it is very clear from a lot of researchers that both women and racial and ethnic minorities are generally underrated, undergraded by students and trainees because of these stereotypes that they carry. There's problems around uh, re uh, respect, salary, institutional culture, patient care and research. So I highly recommend this uh, article as an overview of the topic. And so let's move into bias itself. This is pervasive and this collage is not meant for you to read everything on, uh, on it, but to show you that it occurs in every field of life and work from uh, right through to differences in the types of letters of recommendation that are written for men versus women. For men, they tend to be longer, uh, and more detailed and uh, respect uh, to their expertise, whereas for women, they tend to be shorter, have more uh, doubt raises. And these uh, biases are rooted in stereotypes, which we now know begin very early. And I like to show this old uh, slide, which I've not yet retired because I think it's quite telling. And this is work that research psychologists went to grade school and they asked the students to draw a scientist. And as you will see, 
over 50% drew the stereotypic white male figure, the Einstein figure. And what is disconcerting is that as they went to higher grades, more drew, the greater percentage drew the stereotype. And we now know from much more recent studies that by the age of six, young girls are beginning to internalize these stereotypes and they're less likely than boys to view girls uh, uh, p uh, and people of their own gender as brilliant. So this effect is long lasting. And I'm often asked, does that change over time? Well, it does actually. If you look at these drawer of scientist um, studies, Whereas in the 60s, only 1% of these children would draw a woman as a scientist, and now it's up to about 30%. But that change is far too slow. We are all looking for a more rapid change in the cultures. And I used to be, um, when I presented that old draw a scientist picture, um, people would say to me, well, Hannah, you know, things have changed. It can't be the case. Now, um, that's why I want to show you the study that was published in 2016. It's a version of this who is a scientist. So these researchers took real photographs of faculty members from various university websites, and they got students to grade them for masculinity or femininity. And sometimes the images were women, as shown here, and sometimes they were men. And then they went to another group of students, which is nice design, and said, showed them one image and said, uh, is this person more likely to be a scientist or a teacher? And you can imagine the results. When the images were women, there, was more, they were much more likely to be judged a, a scientist um, if they were graded as more masculine. And conversely, the more feminine, the more likely to be graded as a teacher. In contrast, no such association was found when the images were men. And the researchers concluded that feminine women were judged less likely to be a scientist just by the images, the pictures. And I guess by now you're thinking, what a frivolous exper experiment. And I hope taxpayers' dollars did not go to, to support this. But it actually does matter. And here's another study that shows that this stereotype matters. This is now a relatively old study published in 2020, where these researchers sent a fictitious resume to over a hundred professors across the country. And the content of the resume was identical. And the story was that there was for a lab manager's position. And the um, recipients of this were asked to grade the resume for competence, hireability, mentoring, and salary. How much they would pay that person. And the only difference between the resumes was sometimes that name was a man's name, clearly, and sometimes it was a woman's name. And as you can see from this slide here, both men and female faculty graded the female resume less competent, less hireable, and was less likely to mentor, mentor them. And uh, this is uh, regardless of the fact that they actually thought the female they, they was more was rated more like likable. But the worst thing I, that I found personally is this issue of the salary, lower, offered lower salary. And this occurs throughout the board, whatever analysis do you do, including at NIH where I've done this, we find lower salaries for women. So stereotypes matter. Bias matters, whether implicit or explicit. And here are some examples in the context of healthcare. This is the way we actually manage our patients. And th there's a lot of examples that was put together by a colleague of ours, Augustus White, 
who was an orthopedic, well-known orthopedic surgeon in the Harvard system, um, put this uh, together in a book. And more recently, uh, this work by Damien Tutti, again, a faculty member at Duke, making the point that racial disparities in health and healthcare providers persist in the use and may go hand in hand with this lack of diversity, meaning that when we have fewer uh, racial and ethnic groups in science, in medicine, we are not helping the issue of health disparities and maybe in fact worsening them. I like this very old study now, and I've retired it sometimes from my talk and I find myself going back. This study was actually published in 1999. And um, the researchers actually took a script of a person presenting with chest pain and a, a doctor having to make the, the decision as to whether or not to refer them for coronary angiography. And they took the script and they got actors of different races to play the part of this person complaining of the chest pain. And they made videos of these. And they took these videos to a medical meeting and grabbed participants, doctors, to look at the video and make a determination whether or not they would refer this person that they saw in the video for coronary angiography. And you can imagine the results. That's why I'm showing you here. Black women were the least likely to be referred for coronary angiogram. And remember, same script, the same recount of the chest pain, leading these investigators to wonder if in fact, the racial uh, background of an individual actually was being part of the reason why uh, they were being uh, not referred to uh, for coronary angiography. A much more recent study from the University of Virginia showed uh, that uh, approximately 50% of medical students and residents believe that black patients felt less pain and were more likely to suggest inappropriate treatments for these patients. And interestingly enough, shown in the supplementary data of this paper published in PNS, we find that in fact, the findings were similar for black students and residents. That deep and pervasive effect of, uh, of stereotypes uh, getting in the way of our decision-making. Now, NIH has a part to play in this, and a lot has been said about the disparities in grants funding. And in fact, it was the famous Ginther report where African-American applicants for R01 were shown to be much less likely to be funded, actually 13 percentage points less likely than white applicants for these uh, grants. This is the, this is the sort of the, the badge that, uh, of honor that takes you into academia and it persists in, in help you be successful, this R01 grant. And so that led to the creation of my office, as a matter of fact. And so I've been keeping a close eye on what is happening in R01 grants, but also um, in the career development or the K awards, which is that grant just before uh, you get the, um, the R01. And what you can see here is the award rate of applications from different racial ethnic groups for the career development award, the K series in 2013. And you can see this disparity for um, American Indians and African American Black, particularly 22% compared to 34% in white. Now, I'm very pleased with the results to date in 2018, and it persists that now the award rate for African Americans is 34% compared to 37% for white, not completely close but certainly significantly narrowed and the difference is not statistically significant. So we're very hopeful that with that, 
the R01 will also um, change. And here's the data for the R01. What we're seeing is that they are increasing the number of applicants for R01 grants. And, um, and in similarly, the number of awards have increased from 12% to 21%, but the gap still remains. So we've got a lot of work to do in that space. So how does this operate? What is the science behind implicit bias? Dan Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winning psychologist, um, it refers to three areas where this occurs. These are come about because of mental shortcuts that leads to errors caused by either overweighing evidence, ignoring baselines, or uh, only recalling certain aspects of the information uh, that we see in front of us, leading to erroneous judgments. And Kahneman puts it all extremely well in a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, which if you haven't read it, I recommend it, is now uh, several years old. But he talks about these two systems. The system one, which is the automatic, fast, unconscious system, which becomes more dominant when we have to make rapid decisions. He refers to it as cognitive business. When we are distracted, when there's time pressure, when we are certain in certain moods, and that leads us to switch automatically to our stereotypes so that the decision we make becomes more to do with the stereotypes rather than the information in front of us. In contrast, we have uh, the system two, which is more deliberative, more thoughtful, and we tend to slip into that when we are reviewing things that are important or personal decisions. Now, system one is there and in operation because it's helpful, right? We make a practical, efficient, fast decisions, but it leads to impairments in the judgment in so many areas. And there's a lot of research, entrepreneurship, finance, and management. So here are some examples of cognitive biases that can get in the way of scientific decisions. One is the confirmational bias, and I'll give you an example of it, in-group bias, or the halo or Matthew effect. This is particularly uh, important in the decisions around grant making. And then there's groupthink. An example of cognitive bias, and you can see you, know, you have the citations there, was when reviews were strongly biased against manuscript that reported results contrary to their own theoretical perspective, clearly described in this particular article. In-group bias, an example of a publication there is when men were more successful than women in terms of the acceptance of their manuscript when they were being reviewed by mostly male uh, uh, reviewers. Lots of reports in the data, in the literature on that. And the Matthew effect, this effect where it's uh, giving credit based on past performance or, for example, by virtue of coming from a particular institution, this institutional bias, which is pervasive. And an example here in this PNS article was that among equally talented scientists, early funding success created and perpetuated the accumulation of advantage over time. And then finally, this groupthink. I'm sure many of us have experienced it. You're in a meeting, people are discussing something, a pretty um, a vocal person expresses their opinion, and before you know what, everybody else is coalesced behind that decision, and uh, that is groupthink. And this is a particular example in a study section about it. Now, I've talked a lot about what bias is, and the theoretical underpinnings of it, I'd like to now move on to what to do about it. And if you're interested in checking out your implicit bias association test, you can take it, go online. And this is uh, completely anonymous. And there are several dimensions like women in leadership, um, 
uh, race uh, bias around racial dimensions, and uh, you can take the IAT. And there's a lot of discussion now about whether or not the IAT is actually gives you information about behavior. Earlier studies actually showed that the results of the IAT actually predicted behavior. But I think psychologists are now thinking, why not go directly and look at behavior and manage behavior as opposed to doing the IAT? But what can we do about it? Here are five ways for which there is evidence-based that make a difference. And I've put the citations down there. I don't have time to go through every, everything. But simply, first of all, raising awareness in the way that I'm doing today. Wonderful studies that show that if you raise awareness and give people tools, the, you can actually modify behavior in the decision making. Now, this raising of awareness has a, uh, it doesn't necessarily have a durable effect. And uh, it is now known that whatever gains you make acutely uh, will be lost over time. So it will require to be redone more likely in the context of just before you have a search committee meeting or something like this. So it's rather like a vaccine. It will require boosters. Broadening the images of success. What do I mean by that? Now there's data that shows that simply by putting up pictures of counter stereotypes on the walls around you in the context of making a decision, uh, actually makes a difference uh, in the decisions that are made. It limits the effects of the stereotype thinking. Uh, consistency in judgment and evaluation criteria, and I'll talk a little bit about this. This becomes particularly important in those decisions around hiring. Avoiding ambiguity and the pressure of time. I mentioned before about the uh, cognitive biases and the system one thinking and the fact that that kind of stereotypic thinking is actually triggered by ambiguity and time pressure. And then finally, getting used to practicing, to speaking up when bias is perceived. This is actually a, one of the most difficult and I would be the first to admit that myself to this day, often I'm in meetings and I hear something and I say to myself, oh, that didn't sound right. But it's not until I get out of the room 10 minutes later that I say, well, oh my gosh, I wish I'd said something. And we now have ways to have the presence of mind to be prepared to speak up. And um, this is through ways of actually uh, being ready to talk about, uh, to, to know about the kinds of biases. And I'll go through that in a moment. And I think no talk about bias is complete without talking about the experience for the hiring of concert uh, or, uh, musicians. That was the pioneering work that most of us heard about that led us to continue to ask about whether or not bias was going on in our fields. And this is a depiction here. When um, concert auditions were uh, conducted behind screens, it was found that more and more women were hired than prior to, to, pr prior to that. And so this was really the first of doing this. Now, in science, in medicine, it's hard to have this completely unbiased uh, approach to have our interviews behind screens. But I think it's an example of how it can be helpful. And here's a little contribution of my own by some work that I did. Some of you probably helped me uh, us accomplish this work. And what we did was to actually create a module of an educational module of implicit bias. And what we did was actually we engaged department chairs at Stanford to help us develop the module. And then we asked them to actually be the ones to present this work on implicit bias to their faculty in the context of departmental meetings. 
And what we, can, what we measured was the pre and post implicit bias. And as you can see here, with um, pre, post being gray, both men and women, and on the vertical axis, the measure of implicit bias, we saw a diminution of the measured implicit bias. And of course, this is where people always ask me, well, how long does it last? Um, is it a dur a durable? And of course, I've given you the answer already. This will require repeats. And um, what we were able to conclude is that um, change in perceptions of implicit bias by males and women occurred and that this reduced implicit bias about leadership of men and women. And so um, this is a work that, went, uh, that I thought I would just share with you. Uh, but it has been taken further by our colleagues at the University of Wisconsin, which is the institution that has 50% women chairs, by the way. Our colleague there, Molly Kahn, did this experiment whereby she had uh, trained uh, randomized the departments for receiving this implicit bias training and, uh, and then looked at uh, the extent of hiring. And both in the experimental and control group, she looked at before the faculty hires that were women before and after. And you can see that after, uh, in both cases, in the experimental group, uh, a higher proportion of women were hired compared to no difference in the control group. And when she looked at the hiring of non-whites, a similar pattern in the experimental group, more hiring of non-whites. And when she looked at the hiring of URMs, same pattern. So Dr. Carnes is actually doing a larger study now um, to uh, assess this in departments of medicines. So we await those results. I mentioned before that um, there are tools. So in the context of uh, search committees, I think there are three C's that I like to remind people about that are terribly important. Criteria, clarity, and consistency. Clarify what the criteria are before you start the evaluation. Very important. It's been shown by many studies that if you don't do that and you begin to look at resumes, you have this drift to, uh, to uh, your decision making to what is actually in the resume as opposed to what it is that you actually determined that you are looking for in this position. Be consistent in that you apply the criteria uh, to everybody, all of the applicants, and if there is a benefit of the doubt being given to one person, make sure that it is given to all. Beware of shifting standards. And this becomes very apparent if you are looking at re resumes before you are actually very clear about the criteria, you can see that shifting standards come in and that's where the bias uh, and inconsistency slips in. Pause and ask question. Uh, sometimes you can create somebody who is the uh, responsible within the search committee to uh, keep a check on things going on. The kind of person who will readily speak up and uh, point to some, uh, it, uh, some issues going on that might be related to bias. And these uh, approaches are called bias interrupters. And we've learned a lot from Joan Williams. If you never had the opportunity of inviting her to speak to you, I, I highly recommend it. And what Joan has taught us is that if you are prepared by knowing what kinds of biases exist, you will be prepared to be able to speak up at the spur of the moment in real time. And here are some of the classifications that she has provided for us. There is a type of bias called prove it again, where women and people of color are consistently asked for more and more evidence. And so you hear this going on in the setting of a search committee or whatever kind of committee, and you as an interrupter can just make a simple statement. Why are we changing that criteria? Why are we asking for more evidence here? There is a particular uh, type of bias that is called the tightrope. 
That is the situation where a, a woman makes a comment that is interpreted as, as aggressive and the same comment would not be interpreted as that way if it's made by a man. man. And you can, in that setting, see it happen and be ready to say something like, would we be the saying the same thing if she was a, man, a woman? Uh, there's the maternal uh, wall, lots of evidence and study that uh, there's bias against women uh, and particularly women who have children. Um, and um, one, it might show up as, um, you know, not offering a woman an opportunity for a particular job. And the comment you might hear is, well, I didn't think you'd want the job because you have kids and all of those responsibilities. And um, the, inter the interrupter might say something like she takes care of the matters that are important when they are needed. Another um, uh, reference to this kind of bias is the uh, benevolent sexism, otherwise known as BS. And that example is a woman comes to you, she's um, uh, pregnant with her second child and she says, oh, you know, this tenure track stuff is not for me. I want to go and do something that's a lot more compatible with life. And, and the uh, benevolent sexist might say, well, I completely uh, understand. Let me look for this other kind of position for, for you. Wrong answer. What she needs is help with the childcare and all of that and be told she is outstanding and, is, uh, and um, will be doing extremely well if she sticks with it. And of course, finally, there's the tug of war. Um, and you've all heard this one a woman appearing too feminine or too masculine and, uh, or too uh, assertive uh, and playing the, the, the price for that. So what are the best practices in searches? Using tools to identify candidates from diverse backgrounds. There's ways of doing that rather than slipping to one's usual um, uh, networks recruitment beginning before the position is actually available. And I know Stanford is wonderful about this, bringing in students, bringing in junior faculty uh, who are from diverse back backgrounds, getting to know them so that when you have those positions, you already have the uh, established the relationship for them to know that Stanford and particular Stanford surgery is a good place for them to be. Um, beware of the position descriptions. There are certain words that can be off-putting um, in, 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 um, in the position description. High risk, for example, might be an, an off-putting word for women. Identify female candidates and minority candidates explicitly. Um, do your implicit bias education training. Be sure that the committees are diverse. Uh, and here is a part, uh, place where I would just caution against the diversity tax. Many of you know uh, that when I started my work in the Dean's office at Stanford, one of the first things I wanted to be to implement was that every search committee would have a URM member um, in that committee until I realized that all 25 of us at the time would be uh, spending our lives in committees. So I quickly changed that. So you get the idea, um, uh, at least having a woman um, or an underrepresented group, a uh, minority person, I think is uh, very important. Uh, being clear about the criteria before the evaluation of, uh, uh, is in place, adequate time, I've, I've explained to you uh, why that is important. Uh, and empowering your search committee members to articulate the reasons for their decisions so that there's open and free discussion. And then finally, structured interviews when it comes to the interviewing stage. And I'd like to end by the next uh, couple of slides to reflect on the social injustice that, and its impact on scientific workforce diversity. Um, I think what we've seen in the recent weeks is the collision of two pandemics. COVID-19 on the one hand, which is relatively recent, and structural racism, 
the pandemic that has existed for many years that has a, a footing in the history uh, of this country and in internationally. And I put up just, just these four examples of things that have been published recently that have caught my attention. But I would say the, there are tons of publications of um, highly eminent um, uh, researchers, scientists, physicians who are from racial, ethnic, uh, underrepresented groups, particularly black uh, scientists who have expressed their uh, personal experiences of racism in this country. For example, this wonderful um, testimony by Robert Sellers, who is on our advisory committee to the director, uh, working group on diversity, expressing the sense of exhaustion that many of us are feeling in the space of constantly having to face this. And this is actually emphasized by Dr. Stanford from Harvard, who says we are worn, we are tired, we are just doing enough, uh, we just have enough energy to cope with all of this that's going on and, and write about their specific experiences. And I, and I draw the attention to the article by Holden Thorpe, chief editor of science, who calls us all to look in the mirror and see what is going on in terms of racial injustice and what, how we can be doing our part to combat it. And part of that is the final piece at the bottom here, uh, which is an article written by Kate Lorenzen, one of the leading uh, researchers in, uh, in orthopedics research who has now put together a round table su supported by the National Academies of Science and Engineering of the lack of black men and women in science and medicine. And I'm serving on this committee and hopefully the work that we do there will inform what we can be doing going forward. But I just wanted to draw your attention if you are thinking about racism and what should and can be done about it, to first start by understanding what it really is. And Kamara Jones uh, has been writing about this for a very long time, and many of us not really paying a lot of attention. She classifies this in three forms. Institutional racism, which is this differential access to services, opportunities by race, an example she shows is housing, the red lighting and the lining of housing, education, employment, etc. And that explains the association between social class and race. I urge you to read about this and, and, and get familiar with it. The second type is this personally mediated racism, which many of us have experienced. And it's due to the differential assumptions and actions about abilities, those stereotypes that I talked about earlier on that lead to frank prejudice and discrimination and show up as police brutality, physician disrespect, shopkeeper vigilance, waiter indifference, teacher evaluation, and many more. And uh, in my case, I've been um, mistaken for support staff. Um, in the setting of a, a, a professional meeting, being asked to go get the coffee. Um, it's really quite disconcerting. And then finally, internalized racism. This is the other side of the coin, where many of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the stigmatized group uh, res uh, find themselves accepting some of these negative uh, messages about personality, ability, personal abilities and intrinsic work. And that shows up as self-devaluation. Kamara Jones refers to it as this white man's ice is colder syndrome, a resignation, a helplessness, a hopelessness, um, and a lack of resilience. So that's the internalization that uh, many of us face and many students face 
and contributes to the lack of retention in medicine and science that we're seeing. And here are some examples of practical things that we can be doing aside from every institution and every institute and department developing its own action plan. And I urge you as the Department of Sur Surgery to develop a plan around this. Firstly, openly acknowledge the problem of blackness in science. Many of us, including myself, we talk about diversity and how it is important in improving the quality of science and patient care, etc. Yes, that is true, but there is a specific issue of being black in this country that relates to the history. We have to acknowledge it and we have to begin to address it and understand how we came about. And to do that at NIH, we're bringing in the group from the um, Racial Equity Institute, if you haven't heard of them, they do fantastic workshops on this issue to uh, really educate one about the, 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 the background of how this came about and what we should be doing about it. Promoting community-based research to focus on external validity of the research and enhancing um, health disparities research from the perspective of NIH. Supporting our black peers during this time of emotional turmoil, very important, and being cognizant of the differential effects of COVID-19 and diversity tax on black individuals in science uh, and medicine, as well as other uh, groups that are specifically experiencing this discrimination in time. And I would point to Asian Americans and the burden that they are facing at this time uh, based on the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Adjusting factors that, uh, for admissions and other selection committee in recognition of the extreme burden that uh, people from diverse background, particularly Black Americans, have faced. Very importantly, monitor and report acts of racial bias. You know, we have in the last year, as communities across the country, embraced the issue of sexual harassment. We've created committees, we've created surveys, we've done action groups. And I would, say, I would argue that we must do the same diligence for racial bias and discrimination, put the same vigilance as we have put into identifying racial acts of racial uh, bias and, um, uh, and uh, having systems for addressing them. And finally, probably most importantly, empowering our allies. One of the great hopes in all of the protests that I've seen is looking at the demographic backgrounds of the protesters and seeing the diversity, seeing our white colleagues stand up for social justice. This is an issue to be solved, not by black people, but by the, share, but the shared responsibility of everybody in America today, and in particular in the field of science and medicine for us work together to do our best. So let me get back to just summarize what I've been talking about. I talked a lot about implicit bias and education. And what I want to underscore is that implicit bias education, bias education by itself will not solve the problem. I have a lot of people come to me and say, well, you know, Hannah, I've got, I've launched my bias mitigation strategies. It's working well, but we're still not moving the needle. To move the needle, we need an integrated approach, doing a number of things together that are listed on the slide. One of the things that we have found particularly important is something we call the Distinguished Scholars Program. This involves hiring a cohort, a cluster of individuals who have a commitment to diversity and inclusion um, for, for the tenure track. You bring them together, uh, something like 15 of them, give them the professional development together, 
so that they, uh, uh, they navigate the challenges of the early stage career together as they move along in their career paths. And when the institution and the organization sees them, gets to know them, we get this gradual shift in the culture. And we're already seeing that not only has the demographics of the intramural program tenure track improved dramatically, now 13% of our tenure track investigations are of underrepresented racial ethnic groups, but we're also seeing a shift in the culture. This program has worked so well that I decided, we've decided that institutions, NIH funded institutions out there should have similar programs. And so NIH is launching the faculty institutional recruitment for sustainable transformation program called the FIRST. The call for uh, applications will be this, uh, at the end of the summer, probably early fall. And we will be looking forward to institutions forming cohorts of these individuals within their institution and NIH will sponsor that. They will sponsor, they will provide resources for these, the faculty startup packages and they will provide resources for doing this deep work of cultural change. A great opportunity there. I mentioned before, we must be very diligent about looking for individuals from diverse backgrounds when we have these tenure track uh, opportunities. And one way of doing that is to have broad trans institutional searches. Um, and that could be very uh, helpful. I can imagine something like that, bringing together many of the departments within surgery and doing a broad search and that will diversify the applicant pool. Um, when all is said and done, you've got to monitor this stuff. You've got to track it and you've got to reward it. What gets monitored and what gets rewarded gets tra is tracked. And so we've created an NIH equity committee. And I would recommend that if you had an equity committee whereby each division presents their equity um, metrics each year so that you can actually see where things going on. And these metrics are not just the demographics we're talking about. We're talking about salaries. We're talking about the diversity in the speaker series. You all heard about Dr. Collins' mandate about manuals that he will not serve in all male panels. What's happening in your speaker series? Are they all men? Are they, do they have a diversity of, uh, uh, of candidates? And also the National Mentoring Network which is this tremendous resource uh, that NIH supports for uh, diversity. So I'm going to end there. I'm be, it's been delightful uh, talking with you. I'm probably over my time, but I hope that uh, above all else, you will accept uh, that uh, what you've heard today points to the fact that contrary to the usual saying that great minds think alike, the information you've, uh, you've seen today indicates that actually great minds think differently. And I'll thank you for your attention and I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you. <laughs>